In half an hour, the ways in which digital devices are changing our memories and our perception of intelligence. Before that, though, let's focus on fear. Since the horror genre began 80 years ago, the female role has undergone many changes and the passive victims of the classic monsters of the past have become resourceful heroines competing with their male co-stars. Now on BBC Radio 4, as part of our gothic imagination season, we present a coven of female horror stars who reveal their on- and off-screen memories and experiences. But is it still a man's world? Rhys Shearsmith lifts the lid on The Scream Queens. Are you sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. They can get terribly excited. They're coming! They're coming! Not to mention hysterical. This is no dream! This is really happening! They often have the most outrageous beliefs. Twice I've been followed by something that was not human. They can be lethal. You must die! Everybody must die! They associate with some terribly unsavory characters. And in the name of Satan, I place a curse upon you. They delight in being missed victory. Sometimes the world of the dead gets mixed up with the world of the living. They have some shocking habits. And he made me drink. Who are they? They are the Scream Queens. <coughs> sometimes the heroines and sometimes the femme fatales of the horror movie. The good, the bad and the beautiful. Some of them are my favourite human beings, though, as we'll see, not all of them are human beings. <coughs> Welcome, Radio 4 listeners. I'm Reece Shearsmith, and over the next half hour, I'll be taking some of these delightful ladies on, so you don't have to. We go about the most fearful business. Let those who are not resolved remain behind. As they used to say in the old days, this programme is not for persons of a nervous disposition. So if you're listening to this on the BBC iPlayer late at night, you may want to make sure the doors and windows are tightly locked and the lights are burning brightly. So settle down to some tales of the sisterhood of spookdom. Don't say we didn't warn you. I'm keen to learn more about the development of the female role in horror, in front of and behind the camera, and discover what elements combine to create a classic scream queen. If you're into your, what you're supposed to be doing, it is not difficult to scream. I was the predator, and I think the sex that went on was derived to make your victim die, and you get his warm blood and you carry on living. The audience were cringing in their seats, and when the woman in black is coming, there were screams and people turning aside. Some of these charmingly sinister ladies have haunted my dreams since I was a boy, so I'm thrilled to get the opportunity to meet some of them in the flesh. It's what you don't see that frightens you, because what frightens you is yourself, your hidden fears. From an early age, I was allowed to watch late-night horror movies on TV. Some of the images from the Hammer films and the classic universal horrors from the 30s have remained seared on my consciousness ever since. Blessedly seared. These films ignited my lifelong enthusiasm for horror and heavily influenced my work as a writer and performer. My job as an actor is to entertain the audience. Jane Merrow. And I can't think of a genre that entertains the audience more than horror, quite frankly, so I'm very proud to be a scream queen. Being a scream queen is a long and noble tradition, and over the years some wonderfully spooky brides of darkness have graced our screens. Gloria Holden as Dracula's daughter in the mid-thirties, Elsa Lanchester playing both Mary Shelley and the monster's mate in Bride of Frankenstein. There are unforgettable Hammer Lovelies who unnerved audiences and Hitchcock's famous blondes with the memorable Janet Lee in Psycho. I was in the National Youth Theatre at the time with Simon Ward and my friend Patricia Doyle and the three of us went to see it and in that scene the three of us ended up in one seat. I mean it was just unbelievably frightening. Brilliant. Brilliant. 
Nowadays, heroines of the horror movie are battling alongside the fellas against werewolves, zombies and vampires, rather than cowering behind the shower curtain. I'm joined by two heroines of horror, Pauline Moran, famous for her role in the TV version of The Woman in Black, and Madeline Smith of Hammer fame. Can I ask you, first of all, Pauline, how you think the woman's role, if it has at all changed over the years in the horror world, are we seeing more biters than bitten? I think we have more schluck, which is an entirely different thing, and I don't think it's nearly as effective as the original horror genre. But I don't think there's much improvement in horror films in general because women are always the victim. Very, very seldom the perpetrator. And um, I I sit on the Equity Council of um, the Actors' Union and we have a big policy at the moment to try and improve employment for our women members, which is very, very poor compared to our male members. You know, whichever way we look, although things are slightly improving with female detectives on TV, everything else remains virtually the same. You know, women not central to the plot, looking on while the men get on with the interesting stuff. Madeline Smith. It's far more fun to play a villain, and although I did do the murder in Why Didn't They Ask Evans, Lee Lawson and I actually did it. Um, That was an Agatha Christie I did, and oh boy, it was fun to be revealed as a villainess. I still had a gormless, stupid little sticky face throughout, and I'd much, much rather have used what I hope my acting abilities and played a nasty lady. Go away! Quick! Get get away from here! Mr. Pepper, what's wrong? You you shouldn't shouldn't watch like that. It's not be allowed. Look, you frightened that poor woman away. What? She's gone. Pauline, in my life, you know, the woman in black, when Mark Gatiss sat me down and watched with me the woman in black, he said, you've got to watch this. And it remains for me the most terrifying programme I think I've ever seen for sitting and being and bellowing in fear, especially at one particular scene that we can talk about. <laughs> I mean, and what's terrifying about it as well is it, it, it doesn't go away, you don't go away, you just loom and loom and loom. And when you, you put your hands over your eyes, and it's, you're still there screaming in his face, and that's what's kind of scary. It's longer than you want it to be. I'm glad that's the effect. Yeah. Um, that is the big quoted scene from yeah. the film. And um, I. The scream, it must be my rod of training, you see. I didn't scream from the back of my throat to an open throat, ah. I put it forward in my mouth on e, like that, so you get a sound like a banshee, which you can continue much longer. I know Herbie Wise, the director, dined out on that scream for quite a few years, and the reason I appear to be floating in the air, I wasn't. I was on a dolly which for people who don't know is a sort of trolley, which was pushed towards Arthur in the bed very slowly, and a wind machine was in front of me, which made all my robes flow out behind me. And the camera, as I was coming forward, was also coming towards me, but focusing away from me, so that you get a peculiar optical illusion of her being floating and yet there but not there, going away and coming forward at the same time. It was a very chilling moment. Nathaniel? (laughs) At the cast and crew screening, I was sitting behind five crew members and they were tough guys with a rolled-up copy of the sun in the back pocket, that type of crew. And when the woman comes out of the window and goes for Arthur in his bed, every single one of these men in front of me put their arms over their eyes and leaned over to the left, away from the direction that the woman is coming. We only see the woman in black five times, no more but you don't forget any single one of them. And it's all done on what the audience imagines. And and that's far more terrifying than anything they see on the screen because their minds are working overtime. What's coming next? What is it? We know it's something. There's no music to guide you along. When I first became an actress, my ambition was to entertain and amuse as many people as possible. 
Hammer scream legend Barbara Shelley. And at first, you know, when I got this business of only being offered horror films, I I was a bit worried that I wasn't doing that. But now I realise I did. And the funny thing was, when I said no more horror films, I want to do something different. I know what I'll do. I'll do a broadcast. What was the first broadcast I did? Day of the Triffids. <laughs> I find myself always almost playing the same role. Barbara Steele. In fact, uh, I have a really spooky feeling that um, I just made the same film over nine times. And what do you do in this role? What do you have to do? Oh, I usually have to seduce an enormous amount of men. Well, that's not horror, huh? <laughs> well, that depends. <laughs> It was infiltrated in my brain very early on. Ingrid Pitt. All I saw was horror. So you've never thought to yourself, a romantic comedy would have been nice? No, it wouldn't suit me, probably. I probably would kill him. (laughs) Admittedly, the horror thriller does have a sexist slant. Women tend to be fitted into one or two camps as either victims or vamps. But imagine for a moment that it's Rock Hudson or Kirk Douglas stepping into the shower in Psycho in place of Janet Lee. Old Mother Bates might find herself, ah, himself, laid out with an upper cut to the jaw. And where would the story be then? It's always more interesting when an ambiguous character appears on screen, whether it's Kim Novak in Vertigo, or the possessed Linda Blair in The Exorcist, or Simone Simon's tortured Irina in Val Luton's marvellously atmospheric cat people. Across the centuries comes this exciting story of a modern girl cursed by an ancient legend. The legend of the cat people. Women whose kiss means death. Whose love turns them into vicious, snarling beasts of prey. In the 1961 film The Innocents, it's unclear whether the Victorian governess, Miss Giddens, wonderfully played by Deborah Carr, is haunted or whether the ghosts she sees are figments of her imagination. It really never got the the recognition it should have had. Jack Clayton's brilliant direction and Freddie Francis' extraordinary lighting in black and white. Who is it? Over there. I do remember saying to Jack, do you think she really sees these spooks, as it were, or is it all in her mind and is she just going round the bend a little bit out of frustration? And he said... You make up your mind. You see, it's what frightens you. And they get the same with uh, Village of the Damned. Yes. That, I mean, Wolf Riller was very clever. During the shooting of that, he used to look at the children, and you know, they all had these great dark eyes and the blonde wigs, and say, stop acting. I do think there is a place in, in the network of modern films for the period horror film. And provided people can write a really good horror story now, and I know they can, I know the writers are out there, the period horror genre should keep going and going. The turn of the screw and the innocence continue to inspire and influence modern works. In the BBC One's recent ghostly drama The Awakening, paranormal researcher Florence Cathcart, played by Rebecca Hall, is a kind of female Sherlock Holmes of the occult, Sherlockia Holmes, as it were. Now, to let you into a little secret... In Stephen Volk's initial script, Florence began life as an adult version of the little girl Flora from The Turn of the Screw. Traumatised by the events of her childhood, she seeks answers in the world of the spirits. Her backstory was changed considerably in the rewrites, and Florence became a character in her own right. It always comes back to the story, and the, the performances, I think, are terribly important. As long as there are strong performances and a good story and it's well made, it should do well. When the grave of the devil is disturbed by the plough, the satanic essence of evil wreaks violent and revolting revenge. The blood on Satan's claw. I'm joined by the beautiful Linda Hayden, <laughs> who, um, of course, played... Angel Blake in one of my favourite horrors, uh, Blood on Satan's Claw, is such a disturbing story, I think beautifully filmed. Well, I think the director, Piers Haggard, was so good 
I just loved working with him. I really did. And I didn't realise when I first met him. I was still very young. I was only 17 when I did it. Made the film and I went for the interview. And I didn't realise quite how intriguing he was going to be. Um, so in your very famous uh, scene in Blood and Satan's Claw with Anthony Ainley playing the Reverend Fallowfield when you kind of completely... And Disrobed. seduced him, yeah, <laughs> and disrobed, yes. Was that something that was always in the script, or did that arrive on the day and it was kind of uh, yeah. presented to you? that was always you? in the script. And in fact, when I was interviewed by Piers, that was very much... Because I had just made Baby Love. I was in Baby Love. I was several times had my clothes yeah. off. Um, and, and in fact, you know, quite a few of the movies I did, that did happen. But I was, I was asked by Piers Haggard if I would oh, happy. Yes. And it was quite an... In- I mean, in the days when I did, that sounds a little good, isn't it? But, you know, there was, so much, there was an awful lot of innocence about all that sort of clothes being yes, taken off. Yeah. I was never in actually any... Well, not of my making, any torrid sex scenes yeah. at that time. Um, and um, that was very much a... An, an innocent shot when she tried to work wasn't innocent because she was a little cow, yeah. Angel Blake. Yes. But of course, he didn't know that and they didn't at the time. But um, no, I did know about that one, so yeah. that wasn't swung on me. No, it's good. I mean, it feels completely right for the character as well. Mm. At the moment, it's kind of the absolute um, seduction of this vicar that's kind of in this oh, turmoil, yes. so mm. it, it felt perfect. It didn't feel extraneous or kind of gratuitous in any yeah. way. Yeah. And um, what do you think about the. Uh, the situation with women in horror movies these days, you think that we've moved away from them being kind of decorative and victims. Mm. And is that a good thing, do you think? Well, I guess, I think the horror movies these days, I just think everything is done uh, for shock purposes. Mm. Um, and maybe I'm, again, maybe a little bit old-fashioned thinking the, 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 the hammer horrors. Was, uh, there was something about the hammer horrors that really and truly was a part of history. <laughs> Welcome to my house. I am Dracula. Enter freely and of your own will. Well, we couldn't leave him out, could we? One doesn't have to be Sigmund Freud to deduce that it is fear of the feminine power of sexuality that lies at the root of many of these spooky tales. Bram Stoker's Dracula can be interpreted as the story of male vampire hunters determined to extirpate the lusts aroused in their womenfolk by the Count. It was the 1890s and the new woman was on the rise and we men didn't like it at all. On the bed beside the window lay Jonathan Harker, his face flushed and breathing heavily as though in a stupor. Kneeling on the near edge of the bed facing outwards was the white clad figure of his wife. By her stood a tall, thin man clad in black. His face was turned from us, but the instant we saw it, we all recognised the Count. A strong, erotic element was present in the original stories of Stoker and Le Fanu, but years later, it was the Hammer Film Studios who seized on these elements and added a whole new dimension to the genre. Dracula! Prince of Darkness! King of the Vampire! The theme of respectable Victorian maidens developing unnatural lusts was embellished in Hammer's 1965 production, Dracula, Prince of Darkness. After meeting Christopher Lee's vampire, Barbara Shelley's prim and proper character, Helen, doesn't remain prim and proper for very long. I asked Barbara about this dual role. It wasn't a preference, but I used to like the fact of paying the starchy one and not going over the top with it because you can do too much lip pursing and and sighing and that but playing the playing the uh, sexy one and, and the screaming that was great fun i love that where's charles you don't need charles i was the first vampire that was ever staked live on this uh, and there was the scene where I'm hissing and spitting and vampiring and incidentally swallowing my fangs at that moment. And then when she returns to being good, and, the, and the, even, in the, even in the stills, that's probably the moment in my film career that I'm most proud of. The Hammer films received the Queen's Award for Industry in 1968 while you were making Dracula. Did you feel at the time that you were part of a, a tradition that was booming and was and had a lot of prestigious kind of um, import attached to it. 
No, because uh, at that time, uh, you know, if you were making horror films, it was it was like a second class thing. What nobody realised was that, you know, to play a vampire or to play a gorgon or something like that, I did more research for those, you know, in, in ancient Greek mythology and things like that. I did more research for that than for anything else I've ever done. So they, they were quite difficult. But it wasn't until the film business in England fell apart a bit and then that was all that was done. And then the big names started to do the horror films and, you know, gave them the diploma of excellence. Dracula is back to select his companions in darkness who must die that he may live. If you shock easily, stay away. Now, turning to Madeline Smith, who I now can call Maddie, Taste the Blood of Dracula, one of my favourite films. Again, one of the most terrifying beginnings with um, that screaming through the woods and um, the brilliant Roy Kinnear, of course, running for his life. Was it right you were playing a prostitute in Taste the Blood of Dracula? Yeah, but I didn't know what a prostitute was. <laughs> they used to wind you up and push you on, and, and you did it. Hammer w- wasn't in a good way at the time. This is 1970, 69 into 70. And they joined forces, I think, with American International. So two heavies arrived in the shape of Michael Stiles and Harry Fiennes, I think with an S. Rather an esteemed-looking gentleman with a heck of a career behind him. Uh, anyway, the heavies arrived and they didn't move. They had glue stuck to their behinds. And wherever I went, they went too. What I hadn't realised was that they had come onto the scene to hot things up. Ah, now I know there will be a few of you waiting to hear about this part, lesbian vampires. Vampiric lesbianism was hinted at in the mid-1930s Dracula's Daughter when Gloria Holden, as the Countess Maria Zaleska, took a keen interest in a young artist's model. But at that period, it couldn't be more than suggested. Do you like jewels, Lily? This is very old and very beautiful. In the late 1960s, when Hammer proposed filming Sheridan Le Fanu's vampire yarn, Carmilla, the British censor John Trevelyan grew nervous. Sometimes, after an hour of apathy, my strange and beautiful companion would take my hand and hold it with a fond pressure, renewed again and again, blushing softly, gazing in my face with languid and burning eyes, and breathing so fast that her dress rose and fell with the tumultuous respiration. It was like the ardour of a lover. It embarrassed me. It was hateful and yet overpowering, and with gloating eyes she drew me to her, and her hot lips travelled along my cheek in kisses, and she would whisper, almost in sobs, You are mine. You shall be mine. And you and I are one forever. Hot stuff for 1872, but mild in comparison with Ingrid Pitt's antics with Madeline Smith in The Vampire Lovers. The Vampire Lovers. Perverted creatures of the night find their victims everywhere. I got a phone call over Christmas that year and we were due to start filming The Vampire Lovers in January. It was a stammering, stuttering Michael Stiles saying, frankly, Madeline, I'm very worried. I fear that your assets, your breasts or your bosom, however he put it, is inadequate. And uh, so I said, um, and this is absolutely true, don't worry, Mr Stiles, I will do something about this. So I hopped along to the local dairy and I bought every yoghurt I could find and I stuffed myself with these muesli yoghurts and it worked. Something happened to the hormones and ping ping, the bosoms appeared. When they did ask me to just peel it off a little bit, uh, it was all done very subtly and very politely. Yeah, gulp. I was a, 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 a total, as in total innocent. I mean, I didn't know what a bloke looked like, nothing. I didn't know anything. It's unimaginable nowadays, but it's true. I was, what, 20? 
And there's old Ingrid flinging everything off for all to see, yes. bathing away in her warm suds. It didn't bother me to take my clothes off. I had a wonderful body. Hammer was just a great organisation to work for. Jane Merrow, who appeared in Hammer's The Hands of the Ripper in 1971. The Hands of the Ripper is apparently some people's absolute favourite film. These are the streets, and these are the women. And this is the girl who inherited the hands that Jack used. And Anne Harrod was a lovely, innocent-looking young girl. I mean, she really, she really was, and I... I'm but she turned out to be the villain. One of the things the horror film can do, and often brilliantly, is reverse audiences' expectations. Take the final scene in Rosemary's Baby, where Rosemary Woodhouse approaches that black crib and sees her child for the first time. Unfortunately, he has his father's eyes, not to mention his claws. La, 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 la. He couldn't be all bad. He just couldn't. Even if he was half Satan, wasn't he half her as well? A half decent, ordinary, sensible human being. In what was once a male-dominated field, where the woman portrays a victim caught in the audience's voyeuristic fantasies, today women are far more active than innocent. It seems to be that I'm good at playing sort of evil people. Julia Davis. My sort of thinking always is to write absolutely anything that you want to write when you're on your own. <laughs> Just go as far as you feel. Don't have any censorship at all. By and large, there are a lot of stories which are, are male orientated, but I do think there are roles for women, yes. Characters such as Buffy the Vampire Slayer and the heroine of the TV series True Blood have achieved the status of cult icons. Jane Merrow, Julia Davis, Melanie Light perform, produce, write and direct. There's a new league of ladies in town making their mark on the horror genre. It's the internet that has actually given me far more fame now than I ever had at the time. It gives me a fan base, and when I go and do signings and the fans come from so far, you know, from Switzerland and Germany and Italy, and they come, and I'm, I'm very touched by that. I love my profession, I love acting, and I, I, and I, I you know, the, the horror uh, has been a great part of it, great fun. I much prefer being the malevolent force. It's more fun, really is. Sadly, we've run out of time. In this brief look at some of the grand dames of fear, you will, of course, have your own favourites, but I'm just glad I survived all my encounters, and I trust you haven't been too alarmed. The thing to remember is that all these beings are fictional and imaginary Reese. creatures that can never harm us, can they? Of course not. Reese. And if you think... Reese. And if, if you think... Reese. Linda Hayden, is that you? Reese. Excuse me a moment. Linda, what... What are you doing here? I want you to come and play our games with us. We want you with us, Reese. Lord have mercy on you, child. Come with me. Come with me, Reese. Come with ah. me. Ah. Ah. Oh dear. Scream Queens was presented by Rhys Shearsmith and produced in Salford by Stephen Garner.